It's good to see you all this morning. I have the honor and joy of sharing with you our speaker for this morning. He is Reverend Jonathan Morsh. Um, uh, one of his claim to fame is that he's a graduate of our institution, 2008, but much more important is the fact that he is the church planter and pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church, which is a congregation in the OPC near San Juan Capistrano. I'm not exactly sure how people worship there looking at the beach all the time. Uh, they're meeting outdoors these days. He's joining us today to bring God's word. But perhaps the most important is that he's actually married to Kristen and have three boys, which means that she's a saint. Uh, Jonathan, who's eight, uh, Joseph, who's 18, Nathan, who's 13, and Jacob, who's five. Also a surfer, from what I remember. Um, delighted to have him back on our campus. Thank you for bringing the word. Please come, John, bring us the word. Well, hello, good morning. It's a privilege to be uh, back here today to bring God's word to you as we consider various uh, prayers that we find in Scripture. I'd like to read to us today the prayer of Hannah as it's found in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. So if, if you have your Bible, feel free to turn there. Let's listen to God's word. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by my might, not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Well, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's ask his blessing upon it now. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we pray that as your word is proclaimed today, that you would pierce our hearts with your truth. Grant to us faith to believe all that is promised to us in the gospel, as well as hearts of gratitude for all that Christ has done. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, the book of Samuel begins during perhaps some of the most darkest days in Israel's history. This was the time of the judges, when there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And as a result of this repeated cycle of sin and rebellion against the Lord, the Lord in his just judgment would place them under the thumb of their enemies. In this case, it's the Philistines that they are living under uh, their occupation since they were the superior military family, or sorry, the superior military might. But in such a time of national crisis, our story begins with a deeply personal struggle where we read of this woman, Hannah, who although married to a man named Elkanah who loved her very much, she was barren, unable to bear children. And so, as a result, her husband married another woman. Now, Scripture is true. The Old Testament is true. It does not explicitly forbid polygamy. And yet, each and every time polygamy is portrayed in Scripture, you get the idea that it's probably not a good idea to do it. Here we have an example of an otherwise godly and pious man doing what is right in his own eyes. The woman he loves cannot have children, so he marries another who is able to have many children. But this only makes a bad situation worse. 
it, it, it makes it so that Hannah feels even worse because she is unable to bear children and her, her rival wife, who's able to pop out kids left and right, was rubbing it in and making matters worse for her. But moreover, more than just a interpersonal conflict amongst competing wives, what Hannah is experiencing here in barrenness is what God said would happen if the Israelites failed to obey his law. This is one of the curses of the law that Moses details that said, he said would come upon the Israelites if they did not obey him. And so things are pretty bleak for Hannah. Of course, I think it's always important to mention at this point that for new covenant believers who are, who are having difficulty bearing children, they need to be assured of the fact that Christ has removed the curse of the law from us and there is no condemnation for us. And so the struggle to bear children, the, the trials of barrenness for new covenant Christians is not a sign of God's disfavor, but it is a tool of his sanctification and motivation for them to pray to God for contentment, and if the Lord might bless them with a child. But that wasn't the case for Hannah. She was experiencing the curse of the law, and her situation in life was making it worse, aggravating the situation. And so she prayed to the Lord for a child and vowed to dedicate him to the service of the Lord if he would bless her with a son. And you know the story. He blessed her with a child. And as the child was weaned, as she came to Shiloh each and every year to worship God and sacrifice to him, she delivered her son Samuel over to Eli the priest as she had vowed. Now, this is hardly a proof text for what is commonly practiced in churches today, what they call baby dedication, since Hannah is literally giving her child over to Eli for the service of the tabernacle. There's a lot of times, many times in the past, and even currently, I pray for women in our church who are unable to conceive children. I pray for them to be able to bear children, and many times the Lord has blessed them. But what a surprise would it be for them to show up to church one Sunday with their little one and say, here you go, Pastor John, take care of them. <laughs> right. But that's precisely what Hannah is doing here. So this is, this is somewhat unusual for a woman who wanted a child so badly, but then gives the child over to the service of the Lord. And when we read her prayer, this prayer of thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for all that he had done for her, it's not quite the prayer that we might expect. She doesn't say, oh Lord, thank you for blessing me with this baby, this beautiful baby boy. Thank you for giving me the joys of motherhood. The only mention she has she only mentions barrenness one time in verse 5 where she lists it amongst other other forms of suffering hunger and weakness and so this prayer as we will see shows us that hannah's personal struggle embodies the national struggle that the people of israel were experiencing and in the lord answering her specific personal prayer for a son Hannah sees in it a sure sign that the Lord will answer the prayers of all his people. Not only does she see her own personal salvation in the birth, birth of her son, but she sees the salvation of all the elect. And so the issues are much bigger than just the interpersonal struggle of two competing wives. She does start off in a personal manner. In verse 1, we see her uh, saying, my heart exalts in the Lord. Notice there, she uses that word, that personal pronoun, my, four times. My heart, my horn, my mouth, my enemies. But after verse 2, she drops all personal pronouns. She's not speaking for herself, but she speaks of the Lord and his actions among mankind. She says, who is like the Lord, highlighting his incomparable attributes, his holiness, his wisdom, his strength, and most importantly, his sovereignty. His ability to oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. And we see this in these reversals of fortunes that she details in verses 4 and 5. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full 
are now hiring themselves out for bread because they're starving. But those who were starving are now satisfied. And highlighting her own personal situation, the barren woman has seven children. But the one who has many is forlorn. The Lord is able to reverse the fortunes of people. He is in control of all, the, all these things because he is wise. He is con in control of all promotions and emotions, even indeed over life and death itself. And this is because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns all things because he created them. He even owns the pillars upon which the earth is set, as Hannah says. But it's important to highlight in Hannah's prayer that God, although he is sovereign, he is in control of the fortunes of all people, able to bring low and to exalt. He is not a capricious despot in the sky, changing people's fortunes willy-nilly just to get a kick. No, he is our faithful covenant God. He is the one who will guard the feet of, the, of his faithful ones, his covenant people. But he also will right all wrongs, in particular, in cutting off the wicked. But just how he will accomplish this might give us a surprise. Because at the end of her prayer, she says, he will give strength to his king. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. I thought this was during the time of the judges, during a time when there was no king in Israel. Well, that's right. And the son that was born to Hannah, Samuel, would not be a king. He was a judge, but more importantly, he was a prophet. And so how can Hannah look forward to, to, uh, to the, the anointing of the king and the Lord exalting the king as the savior if the king isn't even born yet? Well, Hannah's son... Samuel, who would be a prophet, in one way was a kingmaker, being the one who would anoint both the first and second king of Israel. And here we see Hannah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is able to anticipate what God would do and even anticipate the prayer of another expectant mother, who, although not barren herself, nonetheless conceived in a miraculous way for she had not known a man. Indeed, this prayer of Hannah mirrors the prayer of Mary. As she says, my soul doth magnify the Lord. He has taken the humble and exalted them. And this is all fulfilled as the horn of the anointed is exalted. As Hannah sees her horn exalted in, in giving the, being blessed with the joys of motherhood, she knew that the Lord would exalt the horn of his anointed, the King of kings and Lord of lords, which God did by bringing Christ up from Sheol and sitting him at his right hand far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And so as we conclude our meditation of this prayer today, I just want to reflect upon how remarkable it was for this woman, Hannah, to pray in faith for the Lord to bless her with a son. And when she is blessed with this child, she prays a prayer of thanksgiving, anticipating what God would do. But she prayed in faith because this is long before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, even long before the birth of King David. She only had a faint glimpse of what God would do, and yet we see her absolute confidence. And not only her own personal salvation, but the salvation of all the elect. And so how much more confidence and boldness ought we to have as we approach the Lord with our personal struggles? When we go through trials in life, we approach the Lord in prayer, not, not with a faint lips of what he did, but what a, with, with a clear idea of what he did in Christ. And we pray in light of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so may God grant to us that boldness as we cast our cares upon him, knowing that he cares for us, knowing that he has removed the curse of the law from us, and knowing that he has given us the full salvation in Christ and that he will come again. Amen? Let's give thanks. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you were pleased in the fullness of time 
to be born of woman, to be born under the law, in order that you might redeem us from the curse of the law and give us the blessing of Abraham, the gift of the Spirit. And we pray that you would fill our hearts with boldness as we approach you in prayer, going through trials in life. May you sustain us by your grace, and may you indeed come quickly and bring about that final salvation. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you.